One of the most extraordinary stories of World War II began at 8.40pm on the evening of the 23rd of February 1944. At that time, a terrible noise was heard in the middle of the ancient university city of Cambridge in the east of England. Earlier that evening, an air raid alert had sent locals scurrying for cover to garden shelters and the Cambridge air raid precautions had taken up their posts ready for any eventuality. Cambridge had been only slightly affected by the war, seeing few German raids since 1940. This night, though London was attacked, no raiders appeared over Cambridge. But when the all-clear sounded, at 10.30, Mrs Jane Rigglesford emerged from her Anderson shelter in the back garden of 302 Milton Road to an extraordinary sight. A huge, intact German bomber had come to rest against the garden's fence posts, the body of the plane laying across allotments behind the row of houses. The plane appeared to have made a perfect wheels-up landing. The air smelt of fuel, and the plane's two engines were ticking as they cooled. The ARP warden for the East Chesterton district of Cambridge was soon on the scene, along with dozens of amazed locals. The warden phoned his headquarters to report what had come to earth, and his superior initially didn't believe him. No German aircraft had been reported over the city during the alert. Invited to come and see for himself, the head warden and his staff confronted a dangerous and perplexing scene. Hundreds of locals were clambering over the plain, their torches flickering in the night, and milling around were hundreds more. While littering the long gouge the plane had carved through the vegetable allotments behind it were hundreds of live incendiary bombs. Ominously, the wardens discerned a ticking sound coming from inside the plane. It was the still-spinning gyro compass, but they mistook it for bombs and started to clear the area of rubberneckers. More disturbingly, there was no sign of any crew. An alert went out to all civil defence, police and home guard posts to report any German airmen apprehended after landing by parachute in Cambridge or its environs. No reports came in. Could it be that the German crew, undoubtedly armed, were on the loose in the area? Perhaps the pilot had even crash-landed the plane and then run off. There seemed no other explanation for the perfect wheels-up landing. It would take some hours before confirmation of what had happened finally arrived. The action had begun at Melun Airfield, south of Paris, earlier that evening when the plane, a Dornier 217M1 of Kampfgeschwader II, had taken off and joined a force of 270 German aircraft raiding London. This operation was part of a campaign codenamed Steinbock by the Luftwaffe, an attempt to restart the infamous Blitz of 1940-41 using updated aircraft, the aim being the same, the destruction of London. Now facing a much stronger opponent, and much weaker itself, the Luftwaffe achieved some results, though at great loss in men and aircraft, between January and May 1944, the effort derisively labelled the Baby Blitz by the British. It would prove to be Germany's last strategic air offensive by the bomber force during the war. The Dornier 217 was an improved version of the old Dornier 17 flying pencil used extensively in the Battle of Britain and the original Blitz. The 217 had a greater bomb capacity and a much greater range than the original Dornier 17. The 217M version had a new Ford fuselage, making it look quite different from earlier marks, and was an effective night bomber. It was well armed and could haul almost 9,000 pounds of ordnance. Crewed by four men, the aircraft that ended up in Cambridge carried the fuselage code U5 cross DK and was flown by senior sergeant Hermann Stehmann. The other three crewmen were navigator bomb aimer Corporal Walter Rosendahl, radio operator dorsal turret gunner Corporal Hans Behrens, and undergunner Corporal Richard Schwarzmüller. The aircraft was painted black beneath, with mottled light blue and green upper surfaces. 
Shortly after takeoff, Stearman's plane had developed a fault with its starboard or right engine, and though he continued with his mission to bomb London, Stearman approached the British capital at 15,000 feet, 3,000 below the rest of the German bomber stream. The plane was carrying a large load of incendiary bombs, one AB-1002 container and two AB-501 containers, in total 860 two and a quarter pound incendiary bombs. Once over London, Stearman's plane was caught in searchlights, and the sky around it was soon bursting with flak shells. One shell exploded near the starboard engine, damaging its nassel, the wing, and the Dornier's fuselage. Stearman believed that his plane was doomed, and he ordered the crew to bail out, Stearman setting the autopilot before bailing himself. The four Germans floated down on their parachutes, landing in Wembley but were astonished that their aircraft didn't crash. It simply flew off, heading north, its altitude slightly decreasing with every mile that it covered. Stearman and his crew gave themselves up to the police. And on the empty Dornier flew, getting lower and lower, its engines throbbing as it crossed the dark English countryside, its controls locked into position. On it flew, like this, for 62 miles, until, skimming the rooftops of Chesterton, Cambridge, it gently impacted the ground in one of the only pieces of open ground in the Cambridge suburbs, missing dozens of houses and businesses, until it careered across vegetable allotments, sliding uncontrollably towards the rear of number 302 Milton Road, its propeller blades bent back by the force of the impact with its last energy stopped by Mrs. Riggleford's concrete fence posts, and the great plane lay still, ticking and steaming, its fuselage slightly twisted, its back broken. When the authorities examined the plane, the first Dornier 217M1 to fall into British hands, they realised how lucky the residents of Cambridge had been that night. If it had crashed a few hundred yards earlier or later, it would have wiped out many houses, and with 860 incendiaries aboard, and also 600 gallons of fuel remaining in its tanks, it would have caused a massive conflagration that probably would have killed many people and injured many hundreds of others. As it was, the Dornier had gently come into land, wheels up, as if under intelligent control, and hurt nothing more than the feelings of a few dozen vegetable growers. Once the authorities in Cambridge linked the four Germans captured in Wembley to the Dornier in the allotments, the story was complete. For several days, the RAF scoured the plane for intelligence material until they allowed locals to view the plane. The enterprising owners of the allotments charging sixpence a look, the money raised going to the Red Cross. The place where it landed is little changed today. Mrs. Riggleford's concrete fence posts, now covered with ivy, are still there. The plane, alas, is no more. The RAF realised that it was too damaged to get airborne again for testing, so instead it was chopped up in situ, loaded aboard large Queen Mary trailers, and driven out of Cambridge to be recycled for scrap. I made a point of asking the allotment owners if anyone had ever found any relics from the plane since, but nothing has turned up. But many pieces were taken as trophies and souvenirs from the wreck in 1944, and some may remain squirrelled away in local houses, their association with the Cabbage Patch Bomber probably long forgotten. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and share, and also visit my audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.